Hello, and welcome to the Ascendant Art Podcast, where we are on a search for art that is descending above the mainstream. This is Mike with Catalytic Comics, here with co-host Joey from Keeper's Cairn and Vinny from Little Chad. How are you doing tonight, guys? Hello, hello. I'm doing better than Joey, who's now over the Rona. I'm feeling a lot better. A lot better. That is good to hear. So for tonight, we've got a free play episode. So we were just out there kind of looking around the news. And I know this week, the interesting thing that came out was apparently they did a redesign of the Riddler. And that has caused uh, quite a lot of static out there. So um, to be specific, this is the character design for the Batman, the new movie with Robert Pattinson playing Bruce Wayne slash Batman that's coming out in a few months, which may or may not impact how they do a character design in the comic. But this is the one that is being talked about that we're going to be going over. Yes, indeed. So for those who haven't seen it yet, we'll go ahead and put up a couple of pictures of what he looks like. So the thing is, is I guess first thing we can talk about is like what they're trying to go for with this design. I know also, Vinny, you mentioned um, this character was announced a lot earlier than people realize Yeah, so they put out like studio promo photos today, you know, of the actual actor wearing the outfit. But for people like me who collect toys and are in that kind of realm, the Todd McFarlane like DC Universe toys has had they've had the the Batman toys out for a while for Mm -hmm. pre order at least. I, I don't know if they've been gone into stores yet, but you can go to like the online toy vendors and and this one has been up for pre order for months. And so uh, all us in the toy world already knew what this looked like, which is basically a dude in what looks like a surplus army jacket with a green colored gimp mask from Pulp Fiction with glasses over them and a little question mark like on a black piece of fabric pasted on the jacket's chest. I I was going to say when I first thought saw it, I had the exact same uh, word picture come into my head. Army Navy store uh, surplus. It does. It just it looks like just a generic green vest. Yeah, can we talk about the gimp mask for a second? With those glasses, that would never work. Like, he would be fogged fog up, up all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's... So the the Batman, which is the new one coming out, is directed by Matt Reeves. This was originally going to be the Ben Affleck Batman movie that was spun off to be his own thing. Ben Affleck had issues with Warner Brothers after the debacle that was Justice League. He um, ended up dropping out of the production... And so Matt Reeves, the guy who did Planet of the, the new Planet of the Apes movies, comes along. And he's going for a very grounded style and aesthetic, which is interesting to do in a superhero movie, right? But if you're going to do it... Batman, and yet, in the previews, I see Batman taking literal automatic weapon fire as yeah, though it would have no effect because that, of his armor. That's, that's where it doesn't... That's where there's a big disconnect, right? Exactly. He's going... Like, the design aesthetic is 100% like, I'm going for grounded reality. I've got a Riddler who's wearing, like, army surplus stuff. I've got a Batman suit that's really supposed to be functional and grounded. I've got a Batgirl, uh, not Batgirl, a Catwoman outfit that is supposed to be functional and grounded. And then they've got the Batman just walking up on submachine gun, automatic fire. It's supposed, it's like a really cool scene that's in the trailer where it's like in the dark. So you just see the gun, the muzzle flash. Yep. Just continuously from the automatic submachine gun that's going off. I don't care. Well, what you see kind of, sparks yeah. flying off yeah. his outfit the whole time. He's getting hit. Yeah, and which, unless that's vibranium, it's not dispersing the kinetic energy that way. No, that's no. and that's something where um, I think some people who make Hollywood movies sometimes don't understand real stuff. A bulletproof material doesn't. It, it might keep the bullet from physically penetrating. But there's a lot of force and kinetic energy that has to be dispersed. And and Joey's right. Like vibranium, the reason vibranium's magic in Marvel and they can use it for a lot of stuff is because they say it magically absorbs all this energy and either holds it or disperses it. Or it's a way that they can get around doing that. Adamantium was another magic material that Wolverine had. You got to come up with these magic materials and then you're okay. What they don't have in the Batman movie, to my knowledge, is some kind of magic material. Maybe they'll say that. Maybe Wayne Tech is going to have like invented something super amazing that they can use to justify it. But otherwise, no. Yeah, because from a grounded perspective, I can tell you right now, even those bulletproof vests, as they're so-called, are only rated for certain calibers and can usually only take one or two hits before they're no longer rated for that caliber. 
Yeah, because the material becomes mm-hmm. compromised. If it's a lightweight material that's fabric based, it's going to stretch and and it's going to. So if you not, take like or depending twenty on the or thirty automatic rounds in a short period of time, mm-hmm. most of those are getting through. Yep. Or you're right. Some and, of the uh, materials are designed to compress or shatter or so on. And well, the other thing is, I don't care. Even if you've got the magic bulletproof armor that is a capable of not losing functionality, the kinetic energy of being three feet away from a submachine gun that's pumping out hundreds of rounds per minute. Now, gr- yes, people who are you know, understand firearms know that a magazine doesn't generally hold hundreds of rounds, but the rate of fire of a submachine gun is hundreds of rounds per per minute or per Mm -hmm. second, you know, whatever it's rated. It's going to be enough that Batman should have been pushed backwards on his ass (laughs) and on the ground. Yeah, because think about this, right? Like they're moving at subsonic or maybe even hypersonic speeds. So you're basically getting punched by a tiny little fist that's going hundreds of miles per hour. That's going to hurt. Well, they show it in other movies when they show the kinetic force when someone's nearby when a firearm shoots and hits them and they get thrown backwards, right? Sometimes it's a shotgun. Sometimes it's a high caliber pistol. Like when Arnold Schwarzenegger popularized using the Desert Eagle 50 cal pistol because it looked cool in his hands because he was a big guy, right? But, uh, you know, that caliber round four or five feet away from somebody is going to have a lot of kinetic force pushing you backwards. But that's the thing. It doesn't have to be a 50 caliber round. Like even a submachine gun, which usually uses like nine millimeter or something, a small caliber bullet, it's still at that rate of fire at that proximity going to knock you on your ass. Yeah. And And that's where you're right. Like there's kind of an interesting disconnect there because on the one hand, it's like, well, hey, it's a superhero movie. It's made out of whatever in chemical engineering, we call it hand wavium or unobtainium. But like of whatever magic material is needed for him to be able to do that, because we just want to show how awesome and badass he is. Right. But then we're going to flip the script and say, okay, but all the other character designs, we're going to make them like, quote unquote, gritty and realistic. But then this gets into kind of the next phase of it, which is one of the things people like we all do is we have automatic in in our head pattern recognition, right? Simplest cases, if you think of like an electric outlet in your house, just anything you plug into. A lot of people, as soon as you see that, the first thing you think of is you think of a simple face, like two eyes and an open mouth, right, for the two plugs in the ground. And the reason you do that is because you see things, your mind tries to make sense of it, it immediately connects something to that. And the same way with people is we do absolutely judge each other on how we look and how we dress. And there are certain ways people can present themselves that automatically tell you, okay, this person is a narcissist, this person is reserved. This person looks like he wants to uh, just pull out a knife and stab me, so on and so forth. And that was the interesting thing, I think, about this character design as well, is this Riddler, in in the comic, his character and the point of his challenge is he's just trying to show that he is a superior mind, right? He's an egomaniac just trying to show, I am the smart one, I've got this. And the new character design doesn't look like that. That looks just like someone who's just like going to wait in a dark alley somewhere maybe like after the submachine gun fire is done and then he jumps out and gets in a fist fight with Batman, not I'm going to go create these like crazy puzzles to prove my awesomeness kind of Riddler. It doesn't seem very utilitarian for what they're going for either. I mean, I get the idea that if it's just a guy wearing a surplus army jacket, he can blend in, right? Maybe that's one of the arguments you're going for that Mm -hmm. you're going to be able to blend into just the environment, walk around and do whatever. Yeah, except for that whole question mark you've got drawn on your your coat pocket there. There's a lot of mechanics that don't make sense, right? Because you're going grounded, you're going for somebody who's probably just walking around street level, wants to be in the background. In a lot of ways, I think if you've ever seen Taxi Driver, which is, I think, the aesthetic they're sort of going for, which is the menacing psycho that Robert De Niro played. If you look at that aesthetic and look at the character design from Taxi Driver, you're going to see a lot of similarities. There's a visual shorthand in Hollywood costume design where if you put someone in an all army surplus jacket, it usually means psychotic for them. Yeah, I think that's because they have some preconceived notions about the military and especially in, in the post Vietnam era that they still haven't got over. Yeah, they can shove those preconceived notions. Uh, but I think if we, right. if we're being honest, we we've all seen that they do that, like that it, we, like. Oh yeah, I, I was going like, to say one of my favorite films, Falling Down. As soon as you mentioned that, that was before, like when he hits the point of no return, 
when like it's clear like he has to die, he goes to the army surplus store and changes clothes into that exact outfit. Um, I mean, yeah, go, even you going see back... the jacket and you immediately think that person is dangerous. Like that's that's what they try to convey with it. I yeah. mean, and, and you there can, you go. Preconceived you can flip notion. The script, like if you go to um, First Blood, the first Rambo movie, yeah. one of the reasons that Brian Dennehy's local town sheriff didn't like Sylvester Stallone's John Rambo was because he was walking around in the army surplus jacket, looked like a vagrant, right, post Vietnam. And they kind of flipped the script and like, hey, he was not actually the bad guy. It was the local cops that were hassling him. They were keeping him from just going to see his old war buddy who had passed away. And he didn't find that out till later. So there are ways you can actually use that visual costume design shorthand to your advantage from a storytelling standpoint. Because from an audience, you know, the audience gets primed by the things like you mentioned. We, you know, like we get programmed from the stuff we see fairly often. And if they keep continuous, like there's a reason we all know that the army surplus jacket is supposed to mean like somebody who's got psychological issues. It's not because that's what it is in reality. It's because in a movie, that's their visual shorthand that they've been programming for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's two major issues as it relates to this take on the Riddler. The first being... And, and maybe I'm wrong, but from what I've seen so far, it seems as though they're putting a lot more effort into the villains, which isn't necessarily a bad thing for a, a Batman-style movie because the villains kind of are the draw in a lot of respects. The bigger problem is you're trying to make this villain more grounded. You're not trying to do that with Batman. You're very quickly making it so that they don't seem like they're from the same world. At the end of the day, you build a world all the characters have to fit in the world, but it doesn't seem like the characters are all coming from the same world. I'll, 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 they can't be on the same level. I'll like, play devil's be... advocate because I do think the Batman costume is a grounded costume. I think the part where he's taking submachine gun fire point blank is messed up and stupid, but I think- well, from and that's it... what I'm saying. It's like they need to be- on the same equal footing as adversaries in order for the struggle and the conflict to work. And when you've got one that's wearing a, a military surplus jacket and the other shrugging off automatic rifle fire like it's nothing, they don't seem like equals. And uh, yeah, I think that's from a that's a stunt design. And I think from a costume design standpoint, they are aesthetically in the same field like the person who's doing the design work on the batman costume there's a definite commonality to the universe in terms of costume design now function within I'm hoping the story maybe they build him up as the story progresses yeah i mean you can see it in the mm -hmm. batmobile too it's just a, like a muscle car with a friggin jet engine attached to it and some roll cages so it can handle some business it's not exactly, you know, the high tech Batmobile from the Michael Keaton or any of the Schumacher movies. I say Michael Keaton instead of uh, Tim Burton, but I, I guess I should have said Tim Burton or Schumacher. Movie. And of course, since we're making the argument, I guess the other question then is knowing that there have been so many designs of the Riddler over the years, what would we propose as an alternative? And so um, I was going to say, Joey, like, I know we've got the board that we're looking at right now. I've got a few that I pulled up going all the way back from the classic TV show. Then, of course, there's that like really egregious 90s onesie that they did with uh, Jim Carrey. I pulled up uh, one of the computer game designs, which speaking of visual shorthand, was it a pair of goggles like aviation goggles always tells you like it's a very like mental type of person. Like it's someone who's got a mad science lab somewhere. I always like the bowler hat, like the bowler hat, yes. I think, and, and the walking stick are like staples of the Riddler. He's got to he's got to have that kind of swagger to him. So, yeah, that's the thing. The Riddler, in a lot of ways, the Batman villains have this tendency where the creators, whoever's doing the, the comic book run at the time, wants to either do a very menacing take on the characters or a more playful take on the characters. For me, I always go back to the Batman the Animated Series. I feel like that was a pretty good definitive take on most of the characters in the Batman universe. And I liked the fact that in that one, the Riddler, he was a villain and he was doing bad things, but he was really, his number one goal was having a, an opponent to play with intellectually. He wanted someone, in this case, Batman, who could function on his level, who could try to figure out his puzzles. He's, he's a guy obsessed with puzzles. He's not really obsessed with punishing criminals, which I think if you look at the trailers so far for the Batman, 
the Riddler character is turning into some kind of um, twisted vigilante type killer where he's trying to enact punishment and revenge against people who have done wrongs. And he's, you know, leaving, you know, almost seven like, right. You know, if you guys remember the movie seven where Mm -hmm. the guy was leaving clues, you know. Yeah. And that guy was not the Riddler. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Right. That's why I don't like it. I, for me, I like the Riddler to be someone who doesn't actually, he's not trying to kill people or hurt people. The stakes may be someone's life, but like... But it's the game. It's yeah, a game. it's the game that he's about. The The stakes just make it so that you're willing to play. So my That's character right. design choice for the Riddler is the green suit, bowler hat, and walking stick because it's basically showing that I'm flamboyant. I don't care that you know I'm the Riddler because I'm intellectually ahead of you and I'm just about being the game master, right? He's the guy in charge of the game. He's going to be the person, the MC the you know the person at the center of the stage setting up all this stuff for you to have to play along with him we're playing my game and i make the rules exactly and jim carrey's take on the riddler in the batman forever actually wasn't terrible it was a it was fairly straightforward i think it was a little over the top and with jim carrey that's a given but for the riddler it actually worked all right the problem was he was playing against a two-faced take that was completely wrong. Like yes. the Two Face take was being goofy. Like if Two Face had been, yeah, um, I think Two Face st- got caught up in Jim Carrey's acting style. Yeah. Like I, I, I think, think it so. Went over. And, and so yeah, they, I, I do remember for that movie they did not play together that well. But as far as as far as Riddler go, like I know of course what everyone's been doing is like, oh, like well, do you just want the '90s onesie or do you want like this more real grounded one? And it's like no, there's all these other designs, guys. Come on. But, you know, like that particular costume choice aside, like I do remember that movie plot. The Riddler had a very solid in character plot that he was trying to do, because if you remember, he was trying to basically like literally steal everyone's mind through this. Yeah, uh, he wanted TV all antenna. the secrets, all the information, you know, in order to be intellectually superior to everyone, to everybody. That was a perfectly in keeping with the Riddler plot. Not to mention yeah. uncovering who is Batman and all of his secrets so that then he has that edge over the Batman too. And the fact that the riddle me this, riddle me that, I mean, those are those are nice takes. It's the Two-Face part that always was the, the biggest problem. If they had done a Two-Face take similar to what was done in The Dark Knight, where it was a very, like Two-Face should be a twisted, just sullen character. Like he, the Harvey Dent aspect yeah, he's, of his he's never supposed to be happy and laughing that's nope. not really his thing harvey dent he's a law and order guy right that's the thing about two-face he is a twisted right and wrong like the law and order side doesn't want to necessarily be doing these bad things the bad side does want to do the bad things and then he boils it down to chance right you know i'm gonna flip the coin i'm gonna be doing the things i need to this is the character right he's perfectly comfortable based on the flip of a coin either letting you go or shooting you in the head that's how that yeah. character needs to be. He's not going to be laughing I about it. I do love in the Dark Knight trilogy where he was like, oh, you're lucky. And then he flips the coin again and he's like, he's not and shoots the driver. That was a fantastic scene. Absolutely. And when you mention that too, also going back to the uh, the classic Batman cartoons, the animated series, I remember that one episode with Two-Face where Batman had like, the most clever move because they were in the casino. And as he's flipping that quarter... He finds this like box full of quarters, just throws it at him, and like he can't find his quarter, so like, he totally loses his mind. Yeah, that's a um, that's a standard issue. Disable Two Face for a few minutes. Move. <laughs> you got to throw in all those all the coins that he flips, so that he can. It's got to be his coin. Yeah, because it's got it's the two headed coin. It's a heads heads coin, and one has got the you know scratched out like death sentence side versus the good side. But I mean, look at it. Look at the animated series, I think, as the best visuals on how to do iconic versions of the Batman villains and Batman himself. Right. You've got the Catwoman outfit is solid. Like it's it's the old fashioned, like, you know, onesie style, like cat suit. But it's got the nice little tweaks with the cat ears, with the belt and everything. But the other villains like the Riddler, he had the green suit with the bowler hat perfectly iconic with this stuff you've got the joker with the you know that's voiced by mark hamill it's excellent character design purple suit joker is kind of easy because everybody's seen it so often but i think the two-face take which was great clay face scarecrow scarecrow they did really well yep, the scarecrow i did yep. 
I was not a fan of when they converted to like the Superman, like Batman adventures, those like last season or two where they adopted the kind of Superman styling into the Batman character designs. They redid a lot of the character designs and I didn't like those as much because they're, you know, they were more late 90s style from that early 90s original made it more kitty so i think is the best way to describe it and it seems like with the last couple of batman movies especially it's like you guys are going out of your way to try and do the villain different than it's been done before but different doesn't necessarily mean better or good i mean not a big fan of that joker from uh like, Heath Ledger? I, you didn't like the Heath Ledger Joker? No, I liked Heath Ledger. I was not a big fan of Takashi Six Joker. Is that Joaquin Phoenix? No, that was uh, what's that dude's name? The one from um, the Suicide Squad with the tattoo. Oh, oh, oh that one. That, yeah, that, yeah. That's Zack Snyder's one. I don't even count that one. Yeah, that's that's Takashi Six Joker, right? Like, uh, just, what's his name? Oh, it's looking. um, it's Jordan Catalano. Uh, <laughs> That's how my wife really loved uh, that old show, uh, My Soul Called Life. So Jared Leto, every time I see him, it's just li- – and every girl – I'm going to be honest. This is right now. If you go to a girl probably aged anywhere from, what is it, 37 to early 40s and ask them, how do you know Jared Leto? They're going to be like, Jordan Catalano? What? <laughs> That's who they're going to talk about because he was on My So-Called Life as the basically the, the crush for Claire Danes. But like you got that one, you've got this new Riddler. It's like these guys don't even look like they're not even registering as villains anymore. I mean, look especially at villains Rags. of the type. Yeah. I mean, look at the Colin Farrell take on the Penguin. It's just basically an overweight mob guy. I don't know if yeah. I like that as the Penguin. I mean, the Penguin should have. I mean, you don't have to necessarily be Burgess Meredith and have like, wah, 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 I'm the penguin kind of thing, you know, but you, you should at least do something to make but, him but a little more. But a super more... villain should in some way stand apart from regular villains and they keep portraying them as regular villains. By the way, the only way that I ever heard that sort of made sense to me for, um, I was actually on a live stream with Literature Devil the other day and I was talking about, we were talking about the, um, the, how the Batman, the Ben Affleck Batman had no trouble just mowing people down. And so it was, it was not consistent because why would he not kill the Joker if he's killing all these other people? Oh yeah. Cause you watch some of those scenes and you're like, that guy's dead. That guy's yeah, dead. That oh, guy yeah. is definitely dead. <laughs> so, and uh, I've, the one thing that I've heard that actually head cannon wise made it make sense is that the original Joker is dead and that this one is Jason Todd just corrupted and broken it, it would be great if that's what they did but they don't yeah no nobody has put any supporting data into any of the other ips since to uh you know well there's no consistency in the dc universe ips at all anyway like i mean did you ever see uh, i'm sure you have Mahler's video going over all the in the problems like with the Zack snyder cut of justice league and how it destroys all the ob- subsequent dc films I mean, I've watched pretty much everything Mahler's ever put up. So, <laughs> yes, I've seen that. Yeah, because you got Mara talking about how her parents were dead. And then in the Aquaman movie, her dad is Dolph Lundgren and he's in it and a major character. If you want to mock Joss Whedon and say he's a terrible person and was a terrible onset presence and was rude to actors. Yeah, he probably was. And I agree with you. And he's probably it's better off for the people in Hollywood that he's not making movies. But a lot of the storytelling choices he was trying to do in that recut of the Justice League was to clean up a mess of narrative problems that were impacting the other movies. And so I don't crush him for that one as much. And plus, I watched the Snyder Cut and a lot of the stuff that people were attacking Whedon for within the movie, like some gratuitous shots of um, Gal Gadot from behind and from a low angle. Those were in the Snyder cut, so they were Snyder shots. But somehow when Snyder did it, no one cared. That's a problem because the you're mocking him saying he was sexist. And getting back to character design, sometimes the way you shoot and angle things can also impact how a, a costume can be you know, received. If you're going to do these movies and they're going to follow like contiguous story arcs and threads, like get your writing teams for each of the movies together so that they can discuss the broader arcs. And stop letting the damn director just rewrite things. Like, you're the director, you direct. Stop writing. And not to mention, also, like, there's this term that I keep seeing thrown around in these circles of, we're going to subvert expectations. We're going to have a fresh take on this thing. And it's a way to stay- Fuck your subversions. I hate them. Yeah, and and that's really just a cute way to say, 
I don't really understand this character. I don't know how to right play up these characters in, in an interesting way to be true to the characters. Therefore, I'm just going to make a different character that's kind of sort of related to the original and then just say my fan fiction is now canon. Yeah, translation. I didn't actually know the source materials. So, hey, guys, look, I subverted your expectations. No, you fucked up the character. Speaking of screwing up characters... I think one of the things that I'm a big fan of, sometimes when you try to change character designs over iterations, it really screws up the character. I'd like to kind of take a second to just talk about one of the ones that I think has evolved a lot over the time he's been around. That's Cable, right? I I love the example of Cable because the character design for Cable has been sort of basically the same, but also completely different all the time. And mainly you can do it by counting pouches. Because you can go back to the original Rob Liefeld pouches. ones, yes, and you can see. And I think I we are, I brought, are the pouches like his version number, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> because Rob Liefeld loved him some pouches. It was part of his design. It was a very '90s aesthetic. So when Cable debuted, and so did Deadpool and all the other guys that Rob Liefeld had a lot to do with designing, they had them. They loved him some pouches to carry everything. And it's funny because even after Liefeld left, I think the maximum pouches was later after Liefeld, later 90s, where there was an example where someone, I I found the art where they counted and it was at least 17 or 18 pouches that they could individually identify. And what they did, I have no idea. So it's just, it's fun, like little details like that, where you can be consistent, but start changing things. And uh, I just wanted to kind of bring that up. I I totally segued into it because I kind of wanted to talk about it. And do you, you knew Cable from the nineties did, or did you find out about him later? I I think we both like just had a lot to find out about. Did you watch the X-Men cartoon, like the animated series that was on Fox? No, I'll I'll admit. Uh, So when it comes to like watching stuff growing up, I'll admit I did not watch X-Men. I did watch Batman, the animated series. Um, I love Toonami when it came out. And then of course, also if you remember SWAT cats, the radical squadron, that was definitely my favorite show. They had a lot of pouches on their uniform. Yes, they did. It was 90s. They all had to. Not to mention my favorite part was like every single episode, what new missile are they going to put on their jet and how the heck do they make it? I just, the, the financing they needed must have been staggering. Apparently they're, didn't, they're didn't doing a lot of in a stuff. junkyard though. Like they salvaged a lot of stuff from like car parts and yeah, shit. Canonically it was an aircraft junkyard. And so like they pieced their uh, fighter jet together from scraps. And I'm guessing the other part, too, is maybe they were like selling a whole bunch of stuff out of the back door or something to come up with the money for all those parts and research. They were selling to oh, third yeah, world were, dictators. They were the lords side. of war. <laughs> they were selling they were like, to the next episode's villain. They were like, yeah, they were Nick Cage from that movie where it's it like, did you want the gun from Rambo 1, 2, or 3? I was like, all of them. That's right. The, I mean, that was a good film, by the way. And speaking of of character design, I mean, it's a very simple design. And yet by picking the actor they did and just a very simple suit that they put him in, he just he looked the part. I mean, that's the thing, like character design and choosing the outfit, the clothing, the colors. We've talked about it a lot on our podcast is the the instant visual shorthand. You talked about it just earlier this episode. People's brains want to do pattern recognition. They want to see things that they relate to and understand. Home Alone, right? Everybody loves Home Alone. It's a pretty universally loved movie. Yeah. Until I watched, this was on Netflix. It was the movies that made us documentary show that they have. I never thought about it because it's just there. How much the entire house is coded red and green, red and green, red and green. Like the entire like McAllister house is either green tile, red wallpaper. It's like all through the house. And that's because the designer did that on purpose to visually get your brain to think this is Christmas the house. Like this house represents Christmas in your mind because the color scheme is instantly tells you this house equals Christmas. Because red and green, red and green, red and green. We all we all know that's like the Christmas colors. And it's just like, it's those little things. And I, until someone actually pointed it out and said it in that show, I had never realized. But when you go back and watch it, once you hear that, you're like, oh my God, I see it now. And I must have, it must have been working on my brain just visually on a subconscious level to just make me instantly think of this kid and Christmas like joined together. No, uh, absolutely. And uh, so, yeah, we've gone very thoroughly over all the history on the Riddler. We started talking about some uh, other interesting characters. We got 90s Cable, talked about some Home Alone and SWAT Cats. 
let's see. We've got a couple of other images we were kind of passing around uh, before the episode. Let's take a look at some of those. Um, I'm currently looking at the commission comic art. So that was from uh, Jason Metcalf. So t- tell me more about him. So he was an artist that um, it was actually my brother who commissioned that art because my brother's favorite character is Nightwing. And he's always thought that Nightwing and Batgirl to go back to the shipping culture. He's always thought that those two should be together. But uh, so he, we met this artist at a convention. That's one of the great things when you go to a comic convention. There's a lot of comic book artists who have their um, art on display. You can walk around the artist alley section. That's usually what they call it, where the artists are working at a table. And these artists will generally have available commissions for either using sketch covers, which that's a comic book that has a blank cardboard style cover that is designed to have artists draw on. Or they can draw like 11 by 17, which is the standard kind of poster size for comic book art. But you can go around, you can find an artist whose aesthetic appeals to you. That's the key, right? Find the one whose art you like, who looks like they draw stuff that you want. And you talk to them and say, hey, in this case, my brother talked to him and said, I would like basically a commission piece where it's kind of like Batgirl and Nightwing side by side, getting ready to beat up some henchmen, like in, you know, like standing back to back kind of thing. And um, the guy, they talked it out. He has commission rates that they agreed to. I think they are much higher now than at the time when he got this done, uh, which is what happens. Like as an artist gets more popular and has got more work, they can charge more for what they do. Don't be shocked at the pricing that they might want. Because especially if they're an in-demand artist, they're going to be commissioning prices up to thousand, two thousand uh, dollars. Again, this guy was a lot earlier in his career when this was done, so it was. Sometimes you can find that's another thing. Look for the guys who are just there early and haven't done covers for Marvel and DC. They're not Alex Ross. You can get commission rates maybe where you can get a full colored. 11 by 17 original piece of art and the uh, prints of it for three, four, 500 bucks. Cause that's the rate they're charging. Cause they're not known yet. But the other thing you have to understand is these artists will make you wait on their timetable. In this case, it was supposed to be, I think three, four months turned into six months and then it turned into 10 months. And then it, I think orig- finally got delivered after 11 months. And that's cause he kept getting bigger work for as he was doing. And, and this is why he charges more now. He got cover jobs for Marvel, DC, some of these other independent, you know, uh, comic studios. So it's an experience, but it's it's something that I would encourage people to explore because you can have the art you want made and usually find pretty reasonable prices to do it. I, I was going to say when you mentioned that, I mean, there's a range of styles, range of experiences, and I know later, like when we talk about our own character designs, like I've gone out and commissioned a number of pieces, and I've seen pretty good art really like really it's like an order of magnitude difference like there's some guys who they're just they're in college they want something to do that pays and they'll do pretty decent uh, character images for 30 bucks and then there are other people who will do a nice drawing for you and then you're at it it'll be three or four hundred and you spend time you get to know the community and you can find a lot of great people at every range and every stage and by the way when you mention response times that's another really interesting one as well that not every artist knows that commissioning is a business because that's another side of the experience I've had. I've had everything from like, I'll talk to somebody, we'll agree to a price, and then they just like disappear. And then they suddenly reappear two months later, like, hey, man, I'm working on it now and have not heard anything. Um, I'll tell you my favorite artist, though, as far as that aspect of it goes, is a lady on Twitter by the name of Inkfi. Because in her case, like she actually has like the full Trello project board. She has it specified like this is where you will be in the queue based on what type of commission you do and so on. And so the entire process, you know exactly where you are at all times. And again, that's another thing if you do go out and look for commission work. Because again, there's a whole range of professionalism and turnaround in that sense. I think it's it's weird because a lot of these artists are artists because they're not inclined for business type stuff. Mm-hmm. And it, so it sort of makes sense, but they would do so much more business in art if they did a couple of these things like that, like, you know, because it's customer satisfaction. We've talked a lot about Iconic Comics. We bring it up. They fulfill, they work on the deadline, they get you the product. They take a lot of pride in actually having deliverables that people are happy with and a product that people like. And it's an art product, right? You, you, you can talk about it being a book product, but it's, it's a comic book. It's an art product. 
So that means having art done, line art done, having it colored, having it lettered, all those things that go along with it. If you do that as an artist, if you set uh, you know, basically a product deadline, meet the deadline, get it to the customer on time, your reputation gets better. You can charge more or you can do things more often, like whichever model you want to go to, and you're going to end up getting more customers. And I think that's something that some of these um, independent artists kind of think about that. If you're an independent artist, you're an independent business owner. Your business can be as successful as you're willing to you know, make sure that it is. No, absolutely. And that might even be something um, I'm thinking about even putting together a kind of bonus video, maybe a bonus episode about that, both like how to do the commissioning, but then also as well, maybe like find a couple of these artists and just ask them about their experience of like what they've done to set themselves up on the business side. And since we're talking about commissioning and getting stuff produced, I think that'll kind of let us segue into um, what is it for our artwork. So I know, Joey, uh, you draw yours. Why don't you go ahead and talk about the two images that you showed to us, and then Vinny, and then I guess I'll go after that. Uh, it's basically my two main characters for the Keeper's Cairn. Uh, you've got Damocles Drakemore and Tessa Morningdew. And the goal here was to make a complimentary couple of characters. We see a lot in these days where it's like the man is on his own or the woman is, you know, the brains of the operation and the man is a bumbling idiot and she's actually the one who's making everything happen. There's not a whole lot of complimentary characters. I think the best I've seen is Castlevania. Mm -hmm. It's almost like if they decided to, you know, quote unquote, subvert expectations, not do it the modernist way and actually let males and females get along as opposed to that total abortion in the um, Cowboy Bebop remake. Oh, like, yeah. Those yeah. shows would actually be popular. They would because their characters would make sense. And honestly, I've been working on this story for, you know, a good four or five months now. And even at one point, my wife was like, you know, Tessa seems like she's way more powerful than Damocles. And I had to explain to her, no, Tessa is complimentary to Damocles in that Damocles is not an adventurer. Tessa is. So when it comes to combat, Tessa has a lot more experience. But when it comes to raw magic aptitude, Damocles is extremely powerful. Damocles' magic would snuff out Tessa's magic pretty quickly. But Tessa's been in a fight. Tessa's kind of purpose in the story is to bring Damocles into that world of adventurers and teach him to start actually fighting monsters and rounding his character out that way. Oh, very good. And as I'm looking at these two, the other thing I'm looking at as well is the uh, the color schemes on the characters. Because again, artistic presentation, like we should be able to look at them and kind of like guess things about them just by looking at them. And so I see, of course, you've done red and green, right? Damocles has the fire in his hand. So that tells me he's got to be some kind of uh, fire magician, right? Yes, he is specifically what's called a keeper, and the reason being is because they're basically lighthouse wizards. They maintain the flames that, uh, you know, guide the ships in. Yeah, very nice. And then, then of course, in Tessa's case, I see we've got, was it green and brown for the main colors, and then kind of like a teal turquoise for the armor, and then finally some kind of like uh, green lightning or such here. So if I had to guess, right, with this kind of color scheme, it's got to be... both a combination of both nature leaning, but then also, again, some kind of magic maybe beyond that. Yeah, Tessa is specifically from uh, the green circle of magic. So she uses a lot of nature magic, a lot of healing, almost druid-like in the way that their magic is used. She can cause overgrowth of vines to spring forth, that kind of thing. But as far as her adventuring party, she is specifically on board as the healer. So she's the one that keeps the other people alive. Okay. And... For any of the other parts about the designs here, like looking at the armors, why did you choose the armors that you did? Well, since they are both wizards, um, I don't like the D&D thing where like wizards don't wear any armor. Uh, I I feel like if you're out there adventuring and potentially fighting monsters and being attacked by big, scary demons and shit, you're going to want some armor. So basically they have light armor that is segmented to cover vital spots. As you can see, Damocles wears basically just the half plate, but doesn't have anything that's on his arms that might reduce his his manual dexterity. And as you can see with uh, 
with Tessa there, like she's got a shoulder board on the one side, but she doesn't have one on the other side. And she's wearing the uh, the wrist bracers, but nothing, again, that would too drastically reduce manual dexterity so that they can still make the mystic gestures and everything. I just never understood why, like, oh, a wizard can wear no armor. It's like, why not? How's a chest plate, for example, going to really hurt their ability, their ability to, do what they to move their hands around? Yep. Nice. So we've got our uh, two wizards here, one training the other, and I can, and you know what, I can almost kind of like see it visually, like, because of course, like with that color scheme, I see an association with forest. I can al- almost like see Tessa like leading Damocles into the forest, right? Like I, I can see that mental image, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. And Damocles being the, uh, the more experienced wizard is the one who teaches Tessa how to kind of bring her magic to the next level. And he looks like the guy that when he's just like, you know what, I'm done. He's just going to like just blast whatever the heck it is. Yeah, he's he's specifically uh, his type of magic is elemental. So the elemental magic comes from the circle of storms, which would be the circle he is most directly affiliated with. Yeah, they take the direct approach like more firepower will will make job more done. Yes, exactly. I also want to take a let's look at the little chat, of course. Again, great short comic that's been blowing up over this year. And so I know I saw Vinny. So you brought up uh, Little Chad and Aunt Karen. Yeah, because the I mean, in terms of character design, they're kind of the two most prominent ones. You got the main, the lead character, obviously, with Little Chad, and then the the foil kind of character. I mean, which I guess is true, but I I kind of get away from that a little bit. Obviously, if you read the comic strip a little bit, but what I did is I you know in terms of character design with coming up with these characters, we wanted to take kind of the iconography of things that people are used to and kind of inspired me, you know, when making the comic strip. So I read a lot of Calvin and Hobbes when I was younger. We've talked about that before, I think. Same here, man. I love Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah. You can clearly see in the little Chad design that he's He's got a lot of inspiration coming from Calvin and Hobbes and then working a little bit of Peanuts angle in there too, because those were the two comic strips that if you want to talk about like the ones that are the main influences on what I want my comic strip to be like, it's Peanuts and, and Calvin and Hobbes, which is why for the people who aren't as big of fans of them, these aren't like crazy punchline-y, goofy comic strips. Go read Peanuts, go read Calvin and Hobbes, and you'll sort of see where we're going here. For Aunt Karen, that one was kind of a more fun character design to work on because we had a couple things like uh, I've talked about it before. She was inspired by Daria from when I was growing up. She was an animated character that debuted in Beavis and Butthead and then got her own spinoff show on MTV. But I always thought that that was a good kind of baseline for a Karen. So we use character, you know, in this case, Aunt Karen, we're using a meme name the Karen of the world. And we're using that to kind of give people an aesthetic shorthand for what the character is supposed to represent. So, cause it's a comic strip, you only get four panels. So using a lot of shortcuts is great to help people know what they're looking at. So that's why if you look in the character design, you're going to see she's got the half shaved head with the swooped over hair yep. and it's dyed blue. These are visual cues to kind of give you an idea of the type of personality you're going to be dealing with. It is what it is, right? This is people see that haircut and that hair color, and you're going to think a certain thing. And that's what I was trying to make sure people did. And then if you want to go a little more specific, you can see that even on the shirt, she wears the sweater. She's got a um, communist raised fist fist on it. Obviously, that gives you a political inclination right there. So you combine that with the hair color, haircut. We also added in a couple things like, you know, when I was talking with people about it, you know, adding a nose ring, just a little nose ring in there because that's a nice visual cue. And then all of a sudden I make this character design, we get it all worked out and we start publishing our comic. And I'm like, okay, so I've got like my comic strip meme. And then wouldn't you know it, a few weeks ago on the Libs of TikTok channel, I see a teacher whom I, I kid you not, looks like a friggin' photo representation of Aunt Karen. I'm like, I guess I nailed it. (laughs) <laughs> a public school teacher that looks just like that, who's full of opinions, but her personal it was like, life. I, yeah, I, I think I showed you, I think I sent you guys that video and I was like, oh my God, it's like Aunt Karen is alive and well, and it's a real person. Honestly, when you first showed it to me, I thought you, you'd hit big time and somebody was doing an Aunt Karen cosplay. I know, it was yeah. so crazy. And you know what? I need to find that tweet from Libs of TikTok and share it. I missed an opportunity. I was so surprised that this was a real person. 
that I should have jumped on it for, uh, and that's, that's my, uh, my missed opportunity for, um, self-promotion again, got to think of things like a business, right? I should have jumped right on that. No, solid for marketing for sure. And then I know, um, cur- now, currently I, mean, I want to talk more about your character design because yours are original characters where I was using stuff as my kind of like building blocks. You're going straight up original characters, their entire design concepts are all coming from your brain. I want to hear about that experience okay. actually a lot. Yeah. So of course, yeah, this is for the uh, series Petra Patriot. I guess to kind of summarize it, it's very, it's a very heavily uh, science themed comic. Also, the other part of the theme is I call it a dystopian comedy because it's in this post-American dystopian society. And yet somehow the main character just manages to have ridiculous amounts of fun while making everyone look kind of silly as they save the world. A little background for the main character, Petra Patriot. Actually, 15 years ago, I was playing around in Flash and I created this kind of like Mega Man ripoff where I like put him in a uh, like a lab coat with my favorite like blue shirt and tie at the time. And that character was called Laboratory Mike. And I just did these like really silly animations of like him blowing himself up doing stupid stuff. And the whole like superhero concept came much later. But the uh, the design of Petro is still very heavily influenced uh, by that original character. He still wears the same pants, lab coat. The only thing that's really changed is his tie color. And the other part, too, is the way the power set works in this world is that people get mastery over different sciences and they can create like materials and processes based on that. So, of course, like he creates a pair of jet engines because in chemical engineering, how you do jet engines is like a very classic problem that you do that you do to learn that stuff so like that was that was part of it the other kind of interesting thing that factored into it were also the two weapons that he has which are a rod and a squirt gun because the other part of this as well is the character is supposed to be kind of a bill nye wannabe if you remember like a whole generation of kids who would have been my age like they'd be 30s now they remember the original bill nye and like mr wizard shows and like they would go and just like blow stuff up in their backyard like trying to do science themselves So that was kind of the inspiration behind the character. The other part of it, too, is because he has no actual guns and he has no sharp objects, which other characters have, that goes into the last part of who this character is narratively, which is he will do direct confrontation, but he prefers to use unexpected out of left field solutions to problems. He would rather think up of like something slippery and trip somebody up or create other situations where like people get themselves into trouble or if he does actually do something explosive it's usually triggered by the squirt gun so that you have these like really big tough characters that he literally just like squirt guns them to win so all the humor all of the theming of the character all gets packaged into those design choices so that was the main thing for him And I guess a couple of the others we can talk about, of course, there is a girl who is a rival slash possibly other things named Grace. This gets into like the actual like society and world building characters because there's two sides to her currently. She has both a civilian clothes costume variant as well as she's like a junior political officer in the regime as the other variant. And you'll notice both costumes feature the color white because this is going back and looking at color theories that the color white is a color representing innocence. And then in the civilian variant, you'll also see she always carries a bunny with her called Mr. Flapsy, which she calls by name. And so that is okay, we want an innocent character who's going to learn the truth about the world. So it's like you just drop in elements like this to really play up that aspect. So that was the kind of idea behind some of those choices. The other kind of interesting thing too, and this kind of hints at the relationship that they have, this one is actually like just purely out of personal experience. But the very first time that I saw a girl and I'm like, man, I am in the presence of the feminine. It was at summer camp and it was one of the female staff and she was playing the flute uh, for us. There were like four or five guys there. Come on, Mike. We've all seen American Pie. We, we're going to make the joke. I, I know you're going to make the joke, dude. <laughs> but that, that, that is the truth, man. This one time at band camp. I knew you were going to do it, Vinny. <laughs> but it's the truth. And like that is the story behind the flute. The actual story. Oh. It's, so I'm, it's I'm looking hilarious. back at the picture where we've got Petro holding the uh, the squirt gun, and I'm thinking to myself, he has terrible trigger discipline. Like, I don't know what's in that gun. 
I, I was going to say, um, oh, and by the way, yes, when it comes to taking notes about commissions, the image you're talking about, he does have bad trigger discipline. And this is actually something you do need to instruct artists because a lot of artists actually don't know trigger discipline. On other artwork, I, I added that as a specification anytime that they have him holding this work on. In this case, it's a super soaker, didn't it? I mean, I think even people who don't know guns that well remember having super soakers, right? I mean, exactly. or at least the knockoff versions of them from the dollar store. Yeah, but we're talking yeah. Petro here. We don't know what's in that super soaker. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, this is like the main spoiler for the whole comic. It is always water. He never uses it for anything else. Now, now the key is if you ever see any different kinds of like powders or lumps of clayish material, you don't know what that is, but I guarantee you it will react to that water a lot. Well, that's another, that's one way to do it. Yeah. I like unexpected stuff that like where, oh, you know, where it's funny because they're like, oh, they think his power set is going to mean that that it's going to be something he can use that's dangerous on its own. And he can like in the middle of a fight, turn around and be like, I'm thirsty and like squirt it in his mouth and just take a drink. <laughs> like, that's right. <laughs> Because, I mean, we all did that when we were kids, right? You taught, you got a drink from your squirt gun, right? When you were thirsty, you just squirted it. You might have to have him have, like, the bandolier with different colored uh, canisters. Yeah, well, he does have, like, I have it that he has, like, a kind of set of toe straps, and sometimes he carries a gas can, sometimes he carries the squirt gun on it. We can definitely attach some of that. We can attach pouches <laughs> if we wanted to. So many pouches. Oh, but, come on. Please, please give Petra some. You know what? Maybe not one like normally, but when he's about to go to like a, a, like a real rumble, he's like, hold on. I need to get some stuff. And like, what's with all the pouches? Make it a joke. Make him fight somebody named Liefeld and have to get some pouches. That's where it would be hilarious. Hey, maybe that can be the real name for um, one, one later on character named Chain Gang. His real name can be Liefeld. Or it's the company where they order the pouches from. I've oh. got some life fail pouches in the mail and I'm going to use them today. There you go. But yeah, <laughs> and one of the guys that's like, are you ready to go now, Cable? And he goes, oh, I have one of those too. <laughs> <laughs> it's in this pouch right here. Yep. Yeah, we'll keep going. I'll show you a couple of other uh, character designs as well. So I told you about the costume variants and the junior political officer one. Yeah, you know, another part, because some of this is just you you get character designs out of life experience. So like I said, like like Petro is very much tied up with this like Bill Nye-ish um, image of like a guy in a lab coat that I drew years ago and I've like adapted since then. And then um, for this dystopian aspect, family wise, like, you know, I, I married a Chinese girl. I've spent I've been over there six times. I've spent a lot of time with family and from like all different levels of society over there. And so I will tell you that has affected my thinking and my writing a lot. And a big part of that is how communism actually works in a practical sense. You will see a lot of that in this comic. I kind of like want to like let people see see like if it ever came here, what would it actually look like? And short answer is it sucks, but it sucks in a very particular way. But that also factors in for these um, these political officer costumes. I did go and just look at various eastern nations i looked at their militaries i looked at their um in this case like their women's honor guard uniforms and those factored in there was something especially about the hats that i like but there is always something about certain uniform designs that just make you immediately say oh it's this kind of a person the other kind of fun thing about this and this gets back to our thing about um commissioning so originally i was working for a variant costume on the character named grace so that's kind of this like rival slash interest that Petro has because she kind of represents being committed to the regime and he's the opposite. But I remember I commissioned this costume variant and the artist came back and he came up with this other character because the proportions were completely out of whack. And I decided, you know what, actually this other character looks like her sister. So I said, okay, I'll color it so it looks like her sister. When you say out of whack, let's address the elephant in the room. She was more buxom than she was meant to be buxom than she was supposed to be she, she, she was what we would call stack she got dolly partoned is go. what happened i was gonna say the actual comment when the guy posted on twitter was um was it milk melons <laughs> got, got that thickness with the two c's with the two c's exactly <laughs> and um well I, I think they're more like two d's but oh, World Cup. we're we're going we're, we're just digging the hole deeper man <laughs> Well, I mean, you got to make enough room. That's right. You got to make <laughs> enough room to get totally buried. 
But I will say that. So what's interesting about that also, though, is that's a part of character design. I think a lot of people don't think about when they first get into this is you if do you're doing have comic books. You do need to specify to the artist if it's going to be a lady like, is it going to be nineties? Like average, is it going to be 2010s average? There you got to go. Yeah. You, you have to say like for every part of, especially for ladies, like for every part of the body, you need to specify like this is about what the size and proportion is supposed to be because it actually does say something about the character and who they are. When you're designing an original character, and this is something that, um, like I said, for me, it was, I was, I had a lot of inspirations that I was, you know, going based on. But I would think that if you're working with an artist, the more visual cues and specifics that you give them, the better the result is going to be in terms of what you actually want. So that I would say that's a pro tip, right? Don't just say, I want a girl in her 30s, you know, who's blonde, right? Then you're going to get what the artist just wants to draw. If you have a very specific image in your mind of a person, like use references, like I want a girl who's like in her thirties who, you know, and start using visual cues. She, you know, here's some pictures of samples like actresses or, you know, comic book art that I think inspires me for what I'm going for aesthetically. And these are like nuances or be very yeah. specific about what you want when you got it. I want this character to be in these shoes. I want them to have this pants or dress or whatever else. And for the actual person, um, every single person has an actor or actress lookalike. In Petro's case, it was a combination of the guitarist from one band along with um, the aesthetic of a musician named Dr. Steele, which is this like very mad scientist aesthetic. And then um, like for each of the female characters, it was the same thing. Like there are certain actors like you just look at it and say, okay, like this looks like somebody with this kind of a personality. And so you do that. And most of the time, the artist will get it and follow along. Like I said, this, the political officer uniform was kind of a funny exercise because the guy did not listen at all the first time. Like I showed him references, like all the references and explained, but like he just did it his own way. But um, it still came out really well. And I'll tell you the other thing that happens too when it comes to also artists having different takes is sometimes when you see things drawn a different way, that will also help you narrative wise. Because there was a particular story arc I was actually struggling with for the second girl. So this one's named Stacy. That's the blonde. Once I saw her in the same uniform, I'm like, dude, I know exactly how to do this arc now because these are sisters. They would have gone through the same program. One does fine. The other one has this falling from grace. And I'm like, oh, I know what I can do now. It is interesting how, and especially when you're doing working in a visual medium, having the visual in front of you can help you take those next steps or adapt your story or make it better. For people who are working maybe towards making comic books, especially if you're a writer and you're commissioning an artist to work with you, don't be so locked in that once you get the art, you're not able to maybe adapt based on the art and kind of make your story better from what you're seeing visually. It's Mm -hmm. a visual medium. So if the visuals are telling you a story slightly different than what you were trying to, maybe go with the visuals and adapt the written part. I mean, that's not, you know, that's not something you need to like go nuts. If the art really works, maybe adapt the story part to fit the art that you're seeing. No, I I agree. And this goes not only for the character design, because what's also interesting is you're right, like because we're still in that early phase, right? There may even be some redesign that happens after we do this but um the other interesting part too is even for your world to also go out and like start gathering references for different parts of the world building because that can also tell you especially in the comics medium hey if you've got a fight and it's in one kind of a setting like if it's in an open field setting forest setting um i know i've got one set up it's like a chemical plant setting Right. Those those confrontations are going to go very different directions based on what's around you, based on what the environment's going to look like. I like I like I really like hearing this because, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a comic strip and but I really as we people who've listened to the podcast know love comic books. So I really enjoy being in a position to kind of see a lot of details about what's going on on the production of a comic book from scratch. It's really fun. Yeah, because that's one of the interesting things. And I think. um Right. Both of you guys can talk to it as well as you're right. You really do start with just a blank sheet of paper and then you say, "Okay, where do I want to go with this and what's in and what's out? Well, I mean, it doesn't even necessarily have to be out. If you're if you're doing full on world building, it may just have to go somewhere else when you finally got space for it. You know, like 
just my world building alone, I mean, I've probably got two or three notebooks full of information. That doesn't include binders. That doesn't include like a binder full of different characters with their bios, many of which have never actually had their own story yet, but they're in my world somewhere. The world building kind of never ends. Yeah. And when you mentioned that too, because I've started like, you know, studying more comics to really just get into like, you know, what are some good ones? What are some mediocre ones? And what's the difference? I know the other danger you can get into as well is getting lost in your world building. Because again, this is the, uh, just like we were talking about earlier with the Riddler, like you need to look at him and know who he is and what he's about, both from like the immediate first sight to the first 30 seconds, whatever he says and does, you need to know who this is. And in a similar way, like if you have fairly complex world building, you actually have to, on your first introductions of it, really, really limit what people see because they can only make sense of it so fast. And I have seen some artists will get like so enamored in their own world. You spend so much time trying to figure out like, what the hell is this place? Yeah, there's there's almost a, a tenuous balance that has to be struck between keeping the story moving so that your use, your readers are kind of engaged and giving them almost that slow drip of more lore, more world building, um, because too much of one or the other and the, the scales topple and you've you've lost your reader essentially. If you're really popular, like your you know your Tolkien's, your Terry Brooks. Uh, George R. R. Martin, all those various people who have kind of hit the top, like maybe George R. R. Martin shouldn't be in the list uh-huh. of people who finished their books. Okay, well, I mean, yes, I agree. <laughs> I agree with you there because he's never gonna. He's. I mean, the world building never ends but... because he's never finished it. But like, Even you'll, you'll actually books. see books that that are out for those franchises that just talk about the world and the lore, and they have no story behind them. I do know when the story build the world building actually ends. It's when Amazon options it for a series, and then the world building just will die. Well, that world it is gets, about going to the dark times. Like, the world just gets replaced with some other much simpler and less either that or the world. Tolkien Society will buy the copyright to the world building and then yell at you if you tweet mention it. That's right. I I don't know. I just, whew. all right. <sighs> Well, th- it'll be a very inclusive and diverse world, at least, <laughs> if, if not a very adventurous one. I'm all about uh, or heroic orc equity, orc equity. That was, Orcs I think, episode two of your comic, wasn't it? Where, um, oh, yeah. where Aunt Karen was like, "I won't rest until we have equity." That's I'm right. going to save all these people, and then she's we find not out saving anyone. When, she's not with, saving uh, anyone. Bless them. Yep. Hey, especially when you're talking fantasy, some. Some races of creatures exist only to perpetuate evil in the world so that there's a bad guy to fight. Like, that is what the orcs... If, uh, and when if you I remember that, Tolkien's uh, stuff, isn't, aren't the, um, aren't the, what are they, they're corrupted elves, right? Aren't they the basis for the, uh... The, I think you're talking about the Orakai, which are like corrupted elves mixed in with the orc bloodline. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, all yeah. this other weird shit, and they basically just... Like they, gr- you know, they grow them, they grow them out of the mud. Yeah, it's from corruption. It's it's actually a very Christian theme because uh, a gold, you know, it's the you know Golgoth kind of thing. You know, with anyway, but yeah, but um, but also, and you mentioned that too about in the case of the Tolkien world building and evil races. That's another interesting part of the character building as well. When you create your villains, there's been this like trend of wanting to make villains like super complex and quote unquote more interesting by doing that. But the thing is, is that you have to think back to the narrative purpose, which is you go and say, okay, which are the characters that are really the center of the story? And then from that, it's like, okay, this villain, what kind of arc do we want to put them on? And what does that ultimately say about the character and the main point of the story? So um, right now, one theme that's like starting to come up in my writing now is because like I said, it's, you know, it's a post-American dystopia. It's kind of like we basically lose our way is is a big part of what happens and the kind of realization is as i started writing the characters like oh well you know it's not big brother that causes the dystopia it's not big brother that causes 1984 it's actually the people and so you can have people who are well-intentioned but ultimately like have one thing wrong that makes them into a villain but then also sometimes like there are certain characters that they just they just fit so well 
that are so villainous that when they finally get theirs, you're like, oh my goodness, dude. Yes. And you do actually have to allow actual evil to exist in your stories. And that's one thing I don't like about the modern storytelling is they try to like put everyone onto the same like nihilistic level. I think it was Michael Keaton who said it best. Some guys just want to watch the world burn. Yeah. Or was it they wanted a tangerine? I can never remember. They wanted a tangerine the size of a tangerine is is what they were looking for. And then we found the tangerines. (laughs) But I mean, (laughs) and that's the thing, like not every villain has to be, you know, Moriarty from, from Sherlock Holmes. Like you can just have one that's more elemental. That's just evil for evil's sake. They don't have to have some, some deeper motivations or some, you know, super sophisticated drive. They just, exactly. They just have a way of looking at the world. And I know that's like one of the principal evil characters I have is just, it's like, look, it's pretty much like if I, if I don't take control of all these people, like we're just going to keep fighting each other. So therefore, of course, like I just have to dominate everybody. That's just what it is. I mean, just you can also look at uh, like the slasher movies, right? Like Michael Myers. He's the one who's last, who started it in the genre and yeah. basically has lasted the longest. And why they've the my version of Michael Myers that they've actually come back to that is now making money again is the pure evil one, right? Where they had the psychologist character say, I looked into his eyes and all I saw was evil. And the psychologist is the one trying to like keep, take him out. Like I'm the person who's supposed to try to understand it. And I know that this person is just evil and can't be stopped. Yeah. And um, I mean, another way to think about it too, is almost like in an animalistic sense of some predators. It's just, it's very simple. It's like either like I can kill you and eat you or I can't, in which case I'll run away. And there is no further thought. And then in some cases you make a human version of that and you add some extra steps, but like some villains like need to be that kind of character. Yep. I think that's a good place to maybe kind of start ramping it down. Yeah. We've had a great chat though. A lot of different character designs. Yeah. Glad to see. Yeah. For each of you guys, what what went into yours and glad I could share mine and as well, just look over some of the great classics guys. It's been a good, good time. Good times. Talk to you next time. You too. See you next week.